the pilot, an airplane is a companion for exploring the world. It keeps him in touch with the world, and more important, with himself. Because no matter how powerful, how complicated the airplane, its ultimate performance depends upon the pilot. And whatever the extensions of man, the human body is still the most remarkable mechanism in the universe. As aircraft performance increases each year, pilots have to know a little more about their body and how to care for it. Because many of the limitations of flying relate to the human, not to the machine. You know, it's strange. All your life you learn to trust what you feel. When your body says you're falling, you are. So when you start flying, you've got to stop relying on your body. Because sometimes it just doesn't work. A couple of months ago, I was on instruments at 7,000 going to Pittsburgh. No problems, no sweat. As I turned on the Victor 12 at Appleton, I reached around for a chart in my flight bag. Everything was fine until I turned back. All of a sudden, it felt like the airplane was rolling hard to the left. I checked the panel. It said I was still turning to the right. But everything I could feel said we were going to the left. So I rolled to the right. By that time, the airplane was in a pretty good spiral. When I realized the plane was getting away from me, I turned on the autopilot. Lucky for me, I had one. It straightened the airplane out. I just sat there for a few minutes until I was okay again. It was a weird experience. I couldn't make up my mind whether the instruments were right or I was. And I made the mistake of believing my senses. It's a common mistake that pilots make. The inner ear has mechanisms for determining attitude changes in the same axes that pilots are concerned with. Roll, pitch, and yaw. Each semicircular canal is filled with a fluid, the movement of which deflects little sensory hairs that give the brain the electrical impulses indicating a turn. The mechanism works fine when coupled with visual reference to the earth. However, when vision is restricted, such as during instrument flight, the inner ear can give identical but false sensations for different aircraft attitudes. Because of angular acceleration, centrifugal force, and gravity. Let's follow a typical flight maneuver, a simple turn. In this case, of course, we'll make the turn in VFR conditions in order to have visual reference. As we roll slowly into a steady turn, First, only the canal moves as your body begins to turn. Inertia tends to keep the fluid within the canal stationary. As the turn continues at a constant rate, the fluid begins to move and finally turns at the same rate as the canal wall. An illusion of straight flight is created, but you are still turning to the right. When the turn is stopped, just the reverse occurs. The canal stops, but the fluid continues to move. You feel that a left turn has been initiated, but in reality, you've just rolled out of a right turn and are flying straight and level. All of these disorientation symptoms can be simulated on the ground in a barony chair such as the one at the FAA's Civil Aeromedical Institute. The potential for spatial disorientation exists for every pilot under a variety of flight conditions. Learn to discount the false signals from your inner ear and the seat of your pants. Learn to trust only your instrument. This is the Vertigon, a new type of disorientation simulator with increased realism. Dr. Vance Marchbanks, a pioneer researcher in the field of in-flight stress, is aware of the importance of such realistic devices for pilot training. A movie screen in the cockpit offers a pilot's eye view of takeoff and flight. Stir in some motion to move the fluid in the middle ear, and you'll experience real-life disorientation. I think we have to get away from rigid flying regulations. 
because different people respond in different ways to the same situation. For instance, recently, a friend of mine and I had to get over a front. We didn't have oxygen equipment. Well, we decided that we'd turn back if the altitude really got to us. After a while, my friend complained he couldn't read the instruments too well. So I took over the controls. I kept her 17,000 and then we let down. Apparently the altitude got to him, but it didn't touch me. So who's to say that you can't fly more than 12,000 without oxygen? I've proven that I can. Not really. All you have proven is that one day you were affected differently than a friend. Hypoxia is a silent enemy that robs you of your faculties and your consciousness without your knowing it. Let's look at the data. Hemoglobin is the red pigment in the blood that carries oxygen. It does an excellent job, up to about 10,000 feet. But as this curve indicates, the ability of the hemoglobin to carry oxygen drops more rapidly from that point. At 10,000 feet, the saturation range is 90% oxygen. The brain can still function effectively. However, at 15,000 feet, Blood saturation is down to 82%. The brain is starting to feel the lack of oxygen. So, it has the lungs breathe faster and the heart pump more rapidly. Over a period of time, the brain will also function less efficiently. By 22,000 feet, saturation is down to only 58%. Loss of consciousness occurs within a few minutes. It should be stressed that this curve is for pilots in ideal physical condition. Someone who's out of shape, a pilot who smokes, or one who is fatigued will find these symptoms occurring thousands of feet lower. This isn't just a medical theory. The effects of hypoxia can be demonstrated in an altitude chamber such as this. seconds after removing his oxygen mask at 30,000 feet. This pilot begins to have difficulty performing even a simple task of sorting cards into suits. Muscle tremors appear early as the brain becomes starved for oxygen. As he gradually slips toward unconsciousness, he continues to think he's performing well. Pilots who'd like to learn more about hypoxia can do so by attending a physiological training course offered by the FAA at Oklahoma City and at various Air Force bases.
Before I go up, I pre-flight with a fine-tooth comb. After all, my life depends on it. If I know the machine's all right, what's a couple of drinks anyway? <laughs> I don't even feel them. Harry may not feel tea drinks, but his body and brain certainly do. And the two he just had at sea level are equivalent to five or six drinks at 10,000 feet. Carefully controlled in-flight tests prove that pilot skills are degraded when even a small amount of alcohol is in the bloodstream. But many pilots, like Harry, still look upon alcohol as a stimulant. It definitely is not. Alcohol actually dulls the areas of the brain which control social inhibitions. So a person feels stimulated. These same areas of the brain, however, control judgment, comprehension, and attention. The very qualities all pilots need in the air. So pilots who fight fatigue with alcohol are really multiplying their troubles. These days, when television has the cure to diseases which haven't even been invented, the bottle of pills you buy so casually can be as dangerous as a bottle of poison. Antihistamines, analgesics, sedatives, painkillers, tranquilizers. All of these can cause symptoms of drowsiness, dizziness, headaches, and nausea. Treat all of them with respect. Don't fly for at least 12 hours after taking any of these, and up to 24 hours after many prescription drugs. Remember, too, that the physician who treats you and prescribes these drugs may not be aware of the fact that you're a pilot. Aviators have other health hazards as well. I'm working on one of them, the problem of agricultural spray toxicity. Because agricultural flying requires the utmost in precision flying, ag pilots must be in top physical condition. They fly long, hot hours, often spraying fields bordered by wires and trees. With pesticides, it can be lethal. All these factors compound the basic concern of the ag pilot to preserve his health and fitness to fly. Flying is like a lot of other things. Almost every time you go up, you can learn something new. You can get stuck up if you're not prepared for it, especially if it looks dangerous. I remember one time when I was flying from Louisville to Columbus. At night. It was beautiful. From up that high, all I could see was a black board dotted with clusters of light. The stars are terrific. I had a hard time paying attention to my flying. I was so busy looking at the scenery. But when I looked back at the stars, they looked fuzzy. And, and then the light blended with the stars at the horizon, and the clusters were, were more like blobs. I tried rubbing my eyes, things just got harder to see. Everything was blurred. I thought maybe I was going blind. So I started checking for what I could do, maybe, maybe how I could put it down in an emergency if I had to. I glanced back out and all of a sudden, everything looked like it was supposed to. I was pretty scared and I would have made an awful lot of mistakes trying to come down like I was. I often wondered, what happened to my eyes? It was probably a combination of several factors. Night flying introduces peculiar visual problems. The area of the retina most sensitive to low-level light is slightly off-center. Consequently, at night, if you look to either side of a dim object, rather than directly at it, you'll see it more clearly. Ideally, only low-level light should be used in the cockpit. If you need a bright white light to read a chart, close one eye so it will remain dark adapted. Night vision is also very sensitive to hypoxia. Since the retina begins to suffer from lack of oxygen at an altitude as low as 6,000 feet, supplemental oxygen should be used above 5,000 feet at night.
Besides using oxygen to reduce fatigue, many smart pilots use simple earplugs. They reduce engine noise without interfering with radio communication. Try them on your next flight. Every time I fill out a flight plan for a long cross country, like this one, I can't help but remember my student cross country. Sometimes it takes a bad experience to teach pilots what they should know. I was up flying over a pretty desert country when suddenly I, I lost my action. I tried to find the cause of the failure. The plane was coming down fast. Something seemed okay, but why did the engine stop? I almost panicked by the time I found the problem. I had forgotten to switch tanks, and one was dry. Thank you. 